So what I'm going to try to do is uh, identify some points of connection between our discussions on Tuesday and the conversations that followed with respect to uh, reputation and ranking. I, I will, at the tail end, um, offer some, some thoughts related to, to specific next steps without imagining that, that, um, that I have a, a clear view of what the best next steps might be. I'm offering them up simply so we can have a, a starting point for, for some discussion. Um, I will apologize. I have a, a, a long, not particularly dense, uh, slide deck here. Um, the inevitable result of having not a lot of time to prepare, you end up pre preparing something that's uh, far too long. So usually this starts with a, you know, come on a journey with me. I'm afraid this is going to feel a bit more like a forced march, but um, <laughs> come walk with me. Walk with me. Um, so worth noting, uh, I think, that the, the work we've undertaken uh, related to the evolving scholarly record sits at the intersection of, of two research interests within OCLC, one uh, focused on research collections and support where we're particularly interested to understand how changes in scholarly information practices uh, affect the library service bundle and more generally to understand uh, the ongoing shift uh, in attention from collections toward engagement with, uh, with the research community. The other uh, area of uh, work in which this uh, area of research in which this work is positioned is uh, focused on understanding changes in the in the organization of libraries. So how are libraries reorganizing themselves to respond to challenges in uh, the evolving scholarly records? So two related but distinct interests that um, converge around the evolving scholarly record. Uh, I know that. Many, indeed, uh, perhaps all of you here uh, participated in, in the workshop on, on Tuesday, but in the event that some of you weren't here for that, um, I did want to just acknowledge that the, uh, the background to this uh, was a white paper that we produced uh, last year, June, June of last year, uh, that was really intended to, to fill a gap. Our, our concern was that while there's a lot of attention to changes in, in scholarly communications, our community hasn't really come to terms with what we mean by the scholarly record, what the boundaries of the scholarly record uh, might be, um, the, the impacts of changes in the scholarly record on uh, library services. Uh, there are a number of interesting areas to, uh, to explore here. The one that we have been particularly interested to s explore of late has been the relationship to uh, changing library stewardship rules, and this is, of course, what we discussed on Tuesday. Uh, but simply to acknowledge that uh, that a lot of work has been undertaken uh, primarily by by uh, Ricky Irway to to design a, a series of workshops to help socialize some of the uh, concepts and thinkings in the ESR workshop. Uh, so uh, we had, uh, as, as Ricky ably uh, summarized in the starting session on Tuesday, um, an initial workshop right around the time of the release of the report um, in June of 2014 in Amsterdam, uh, followed by uh, meetings in Washington, Chicago. And then uh, we thought maybe ending today, um, or excuse me, this week here, in uh, in San Francisco, uh, the the focus of these meetings was to uh, help bring together the library and related stakeholder community to think about what the boundaries of the evolving, evolving scholarly record uh, might be, and to think together about uh, changes in the curatorial roles. Uh, now that said, uh, the the intent was not necessarily to identify a specific action agenda through those individual workshops. Um, I'll be sharing some thoughts here about where we might go with that, but this is meant to be a conversation, so uh, please do, please do um, feel free to, to, to contribute your opinion about where you think we should be uh, taking, taking this work. Um, I did want to, to acknowledge um, those 
participants who um, contributed to the discussions on on Tuesday, I, I found them um, enormously helpful, these, these lightning talks that were contributed uh, by partner institutions. Uh, and, and as Jim uh, suggested in his summary on, on Tuesday, that we covered a whole lot of ground, very difficult to, to synthesize, but just to touch on some highlights that seem to me pertinent uh, in as much as they, they connect up with some of the issues that we've identified. Uh, in the last day and a half, uh, with respect to selection uh, for the institutional repository, there was uh, clearly, uh, both in the lightning rounds and in the subsequent discussion, um, attention to the need to, to, uh, to automate some of that, that the, the work of, of hand feeding the IR uh, is enormously difficult, which does raise questions then about uh, if you are going to automate harvesting protocols, what do those, what do those look like? Who gets to say? Um, so interesting trend toward, toward automation and, and also, um, as I think was evident in the last couple of days, increasing attention to the role of the institutional repository, not necessarily as a comprehensive content repository, an open access uh, repository um, uh, specifically, but rather uh, a campus bibliography, and, and Wouter spoke to, to some of this as well. Uh, we also had some some uh, very good touch points with respect to support for uh, for researchers, uh, specifically looking at uh, support building trust around research data management uh, practices, but but clearly acknowledging that there's uh, some tension in reengaging with the research community about the value of a library service role in this space. That was another theme that was really echoed, um, including in Anurag's uh, remarks about uh, competing competing imperatives. Uh, we, we heard from, uh, from colleagues uh, with respect to uh, intra-institutional collaboration within the university, finding other units, whether that be research administration, academic uh, support services, uh, finding an ally, finding a champion who can help advance uh, a view of what the library's contribution might be. And it was, it was striking to me that both uh, the Holly and, and Kristen had a, a very positive view of what's possible on their campus because they have good relationships in place. Um, it did make me wonder, though, what does that work look like of finding an internal ally or champion uh, in certain circumstances where there is, if not an adversarial relationship, one would hope that those are rare, uh, between the library and other um, uh, key stakeholders on campus, but where that, that connection hasn't yet been made. Because I think we, we mostly heard from places that, by and large, we heard uh, people stand up and voluntarily say, you know, I, I have a very good relationship, but what does that look like in institutions where that relationship is less uh, strong? Uh, and we also uh, had some, some very nice uh, contributions uh, outlining how, how partner institutions have thought about collaboration, uh, conscious coordination with external entities. And uh, that was, that was uh, uh, particularly valuable, um, I think, in helping us to think about both the, the imperative to collaborate, the need to find above institution uh, solutions to some of the challenges around uh, managing the evolving scholarly record, uh, but also the the risks that that entails. That it's it's not an easy thing um, to to surrender a certain amount of responsibility for the scholarly record, uh, and engaging particularly with commercial partners in stewardship has has. Um, has uh, specific challenges associated with it. So, so very nice um, touch points provided by those, by those lightning rounds. And I, I just want to express my personal thanks again to, to those of you who prepared those remarks. They, they were all uh, very, very thoughtfully done and gave us a lot of um, uh, substance for the, for the uh, ensuing conversations in, in plenary. We, uh, we focused our attention in the discussions on Tuesday, as I said, on stewardship, changing, uh, changing library stewardship models. Uh, I, I, did, I did want to, to acknowledge, though, that uh, there's an important connection uh, that we haven't necessarily made it explicit, uh, but between the, the library stewardship role in the evolving scholarly record and our interests in library roles in uh, reputation management. And, uh, and ranking. I think it's worth uh, just a, a moment's notice here uh, that, that, uh, that the motivations 
to seek support for reputation management are, um, and I, I think this has been touched upon implicitly in some of our discussions, uh, are different. The incentives for individuals and institutions to engage in reputation management um, are, uh, are, are different in kind and potentially require a different approach in service development. So for the individual researcher, clearly there's an interest in, in uh, notability here. I'm borrowing that term from the, from the Wikipedia context where you think about your discoverability based on how notable you are. Do, are do, have you actually made it to the ranks of the notable? Uh, clearly uh, also an overwhelming concern, and I think Jiro spoke to this um, really quite eloquently yesterday, uh, norms, that there's, there's an interest in ensuring that your work is represented because it's part of a scholarly communication practice that focus on, uh, focuses on reproducibility and ethics and doing the right thing in your disciplinary context. So it's not pure self-promotion. It's about participation in uh, the social enterprise of, of scholarship. Uh, from the institutional perspective, I think much clearly, uh, much more uh, attention we've, has been paid to that in the last couple of days, the institutional uh, interests both in, in securing uh, external funding, but also in, in uh, ensuring that you have a, a durable following in terms of a student enrollment, uh, faculty recruitment, and retention. Uh, in general, in our conversations and, and our claim, I think, to seeing a relationship with the library has been uh, in recognizing that the, uh, the incentives um, are supported by citations, right? You build your reputation through some measure of uh, the, the citation activity around your work, and all of this is supported by metadata. Metadata about individuals, author IDs, ORCIDs, uh, digital object identifiers, uh, licenses around uh, reuse of the content, and uh, to developed to a lesser degree, uh, attention around those explicit uh, commitments to, to persistence and uh, preservation. So, so this is really a, a statement of the evidence, uh, of the evident, uh, uh, perhaps, but, or the obvious, I should say. Uh, but I just wanted to make it clear that part of our concern here is, is about metadata practices and the degree to which libraries participate in a set of metadata practices that support the uh, related but different aims of institutions and individuals in uh, managing reputation and ranking. Uh, so I'm afraid you'll have to, this is part of the long, long march. Uh, you'll have to indulge me for a moment here. Uh, I wanted to take a nostalgic look back uh, into the past when the library's role in stewardship of the scholarly record and uh, propagation of, of scholarly reputation was, was abundantly clear. Uh, I don't know how many of you might be uh, familiar with this particular kind of uh, publication format, the Titre Travaux Scientifiques. Um, it, was, it was a common uh, publication format from the 18th century right up uh, to the period that Amy Brand was talking about of the rise of, of co-authorship. It, it was a personal metadata aggregation. It was something that individual scholars, uh, this example happens to be from, from France, but uh, it was a practice that was uh, internationally followed. Uh, individual scholars created a metadata aggregation that was their bibliography of uh, not just their selected works, but all of their works. There was a lot of attention to having a really comprehensive record of all of the work that you had produced in a scholarly communications chain where there wasn't anybody else who was going to step in and do that on your, um, on your behalf. They're, they're um, quite marvelous uh, works, uh, and I, I spent many years actually reading many of these personal bibliographies, hence my uh, indulgence in including it, including it here. Um, it seems to me that, that um, we need to be attentive to the fact that, that the traditional practice of, of um, ensuring that your, your scholarly reputation made it down through the ages. So this is really about not just preservation of content, but preservation of reputation and, and impact through metadata, not, not through the content itself, but specifically uh, through the metadata. Uh, these works generally were produced uh, in support of uh, an application for uh, professorship or uh, participation in, in, a, in a, an academy of sciences or an elite uh, scholarly society. But they were also a part of the scholarly communications chain uh, in their own right. They were collected by other scholars who wanted to know who was producing more, 
Um, and through this um, means, they entered into personal collections of other uh, scholars. And on ultimately, uh, in many instances, this was how they ended up in our university uh, research collections today. Um, I was going to say we should pause for a moment and, and appreciate the emblematic beauty of that, um, uh, of the, the, the ex libris, the, the, the um, what do we call these things? Book plate, thank you, uh, of the book plate here. Um, it's, uh, because it, it, is, it does kind of wonderfully document a, a, a kind of uh, a set of very familiar scholarly communication practices that were in place for a long time. This is the book plate of the zoologist at uh, UC Berkeley who collected this titre travaux of Mathias Duval, a zoologist of the 19th century, um, who would be I've forgotten were it not for this kind of compilation of the works that he produced, many of which are now no longer available, made it into uh, the professor's uh, private collection that his book plate is, uh, has a lovely uh, rendering of his personal library in his home. And if you look at the windows, you can just see the bell tower of Berkeley. So this is a view of, from his personal library to the, to the campus. So there's this beautiful kind of circuit here of uh, propagation, self-publishing, collection, makes it into the, to the university record, and it has a preservation of this uh, scholarly identity and um, measure of, of uh, his, his reputation and importance at the time. Uh, sharp contrast with uh, the, the world we live in today. Uh, we, we've heard a lot over the last couple of days about, um, about the role of metadata uh, harvesting and uh, particular reference to, to implementations of symplectic elements in the e-scholarship repository. This is just a view of, of uh, uh, a personal if bibliography, if you will, in, in that context. Uh, what I really want to point to here is how implementation of this uh, network level infrastructure, this metadata harvesting uh, provided by a, a third party, uh, is supporting both the production of something like a personal bibliography and uh, the, the larger campus bibliography. So it is trying to strike a, a balance between uh, those related but different aims of, of personal reputation management and institutional reputation management. And very nice that the library, uh, we heard about some of the challenges, but we heard also that the library has been, uh, that CDL and the campus libraries have been successful in, in pointing up the value both to the institution and to individual uh, scholars in implementing this kind of um, metadata management practice. We've, uh, we spoke uh, quite, a, quite a bit on, on uh, Tuesday about selection, about uh, the increasing scope and complexity of the evolving scholarly record, the challenges associated with identifying what should be brought under institutional or collaborative stewardship. Uh, we were very much focused on the, kind of the enormity, on the enormity of, of the task. Uh, but I, I think it is worth acknowledging that um, and, and this really relates to our, our uh, collective concern about selection, that we're operating now in an environment where there is more stuff, but the general interest is not in understanding how much stuff, but what the right stuff is. And this actually was beautifully illustrated, I thought, by, by Anurag earlier when he was uh, saying that uh, the instances when uh, individuals who have profiles in Google Scholar actually bother to supplement their bibliography with other resources is quite rare. In other words, Google saw what, what the coverage that Google Scholar provides is regarded as, as sufficient. So very interesting and I think important in the context of our thinking about our stewardship and, and selection operations to acknowledge that uh, what counts will be different from what's produced and who gets to say what counts will, uh, will vary. So um, we heard uh, a couple of people uh, referencing the changes to the NIH uh, biosketch requirements with the expectation that, uh, that those uh, submitting uh, R1 grant proposals uh, identify five significant uh, publications. We also heard about the four uh, that need to be identified in the case of the uh, research uh, uh, evaluation framework, uh, excellence framework. Um, so, attention to, to what part 
counts. Um, and I just want to highlight this because I, th I think we need to think about how to, to build this into uh, selection for stewardship um, in, 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 our, um, in our institutional strategies for, for preservation of, of the scholarly uh, record. Um, it was interesting to me that, that Anurag referenced this uh, view of the, the life's total life cycle output. Uh, maybe it's going to be hundreds of articles. Maybe it will be a handful of, of significant monographs. Uh, maybe it's going to be a different kind of, of output all together. Um, and in this context, um, I, I wanted to, to point to this. I don't know if some of you may have, have seen this. It, it appeared in, um, in May in the Times Higher Education. Uh, these are the remarks of Mark uh, Wolpert, the chief scientific advisor to the, to the UK government. Uh, he had been speaking at a scholarly a scholarly publishing conference, and, and he observed that um, he predicts that we're moving into an environment where the scholarly record, the total output of an individual uh, highly cited um, researcher, might amount to three, three publications. So diffusion of the scholarly record, but also a kind of refactoring of what the unit of measure is. Now, of course, he's not talking about traditional articles here. He's talking about dynamic documents that are enriched over time, that are validated, revalidated, um, but a very different understanding of the scholarly record than we're accustomed to thinking about. I think that, that we think about uh, providing metadata structures for never mind uh, reputational and, and ranking um, assessments around and interestingly, he actually calls out some of the, the metadata requirements here that uh, you would not only need to have a kite hawk, in other words, a quality, a quality certifications around this much smaller number of much richer publications, but also, as he puts it, a golden thread that links the body of work uh, together. Uh, this very much in keeping with our understanding of, of the diffusion of the scholarly record, the, the complexity of the relationships between different units that are related to that single, single publication. Enormous metadata challenges for us here, but enormous opportunity, I think, too, in as much as libraries have an opportunity to think about the kind of metadata support uh, we offer to scholars for this enriched scholarly record, right? We, we, we work mostly in a metadata environment that has been informed by past scholarly practice, by, by the containers that were important in the past. I think we need to be thinking very seriously about how these changes in the scholarly environment affect our local and collective metadata management practices because to be credible partners to our research community, we need to acknowledge that their own view of what counts needs to be represented in our, uh, in our discovery environments, in our uh, long-term stewardship uh, practices, practices as well. So here, moving into um, just personal opinion, really, on, on where I think there are, are some, uh, some opportunities uh, there was clearly a lot of uh, traction, a lot of interest in, in the, the terminology and the framework that, that Herbert von de Sampel uh, used in, in a couple of the evolving scholarly uh, record workshops where he differentiates, he distinguishes between uh, recording infrastructure and archiving uh, infrastructure. And it seems to me that, that um, although we have over the past couple of days talked in terms of, of choices about service provision around some of this, uh, that it may be less a question of, of making choices between uh, services for stewardship uh, or stu services for archiving versus uh, uh, services related to the recording infrastructure. It seems to me that we can think about a tiered, or as I've characterized it here um, in the mode of differential pricing schemes, a differential service model. So we do have, um, it seems to me, interesting opportunities in the library community to think about uh, that, that service bundle around research support and um, acknowledging that 
our, uh, our customer base, our faculty and scholars, are engaging in a broader network environment. They are using external repositories. In some cases, we want to encourage them to use repository infrastructure that we cannot source. Uh, locally, that we should see that as something that relates to the acknowledgement of the importance of this new recording infrastructure. It's, it's a service engagement that we deliver to our faculty and students, but it's in that conscious coordination model of understanding that we're operating uh, inside of a much larger recording infrastructure. Uh, and related to that, I think, um, is the opportunity to think selectively about how we want to engage with parts of that recording infrastructure. So uh, we've talked about some examples of, of workflow support tools that have been um, selectively integrated into the library service bundle, often through licensing agreements with, with the partner, whether it's Mendeley or, or Figshare. And it seems to me this is something where, this is a, a different kind of selection challenge for us. It's, it's not about the selection of the content, it's the selection of the external partners with whom we as a community want to work because as we've seen in many illustrations um, over the last couple of days, there is this enormous proliferation of support tools available. Uh, if we are collectively to leverage uh, our ability to shape that service offer, we need collectively to have a point of view about which of those workflow support tools or suites of tools are most interesting to us so that we can collectively exercise some uh, kind of influence on on the nature of, of the service offer. <clears throat> we heard uh, yesterday quite a lot of attention to, to the institutional uh, uh, bibliography, and, and Jim referenced this in, in his wrap-up as well, um, really tantalizing opportunities for, uh, for library service provision, whether that's sourced by the library or externally, I think is another question, of services that are layered on top of that institutional uh, bibliography. So, so we had from Vouter some really great examples of, of how one could think creatively about using that much richer metadata resource of the institutional uh, bibliography to provide uh, disciplinary views of the library collection to, to influence the way we provide recommender services uh, or views of uh, relevance ranking in our discovery systems. Just a, a host of really uh, tantalizing opportunities uh, for us in, in that space. Um, and then finally moving into to that uh, other part of the, the infrastructure that, that Herbert um, had described as, as archiving infrastructure. We clearly, and this was the basis of our conversation on Tuesday, need to be thinking about what, what that service will look like. These are all services that the library has a stake in. Our ability to invest in them is going to vary, um, and indeed that's uh, where I go with this um, smart art, as they call it. I'm, I'm not sure an equilateral triangle counts as smart art. Um, scaling triangles, maybe that's, maybe that's smart art. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, here, I'm, I'm simply trying to take uh, those broad categories of, well, of services we'll get to. I want to, to map them to those broad categories of, of uh, uh, needs in the community, and there again, both institutional needs and uh, individual scholar needs, um, and suggest uh, that there is a mapping to services around, I'm calling it business intelligence. Uh, you could think of this as all of us getting collectively smarter, not just about the universe of workflow support tools, uh, but which ones are important to our constituency. Uh, so, so this is something that the University of Utrecht is interested, we've, we've heard about the work that they're doing to survey the uh, research community about which workflow support tools uh, are in use. So we collectively, and I think, um, uh, Cliff alluded to this uh, as well, we need to have a better picture of where uh, where our faculty and researchers are moving in that larger network environment so that we can make selection decisions about who we're going to partner with. Uh, I've already uh, alluded to the importance of, of metadata management and its associated um, uh, importance with institutional and, and uh, personal reputation management. And then uh, for stewardship, I think it's, it's self-evident. We're, we're talking about getting closer to understanding what those machine-readable stewardship um, claims, selection protocols are going to look like. And then, of course, the undergirding repository infrastructure. I think that's the piece that we've all been talking about uh, for, for years. Uh, now, I, I, uh, my, my intent in arraying these uh, in, along this, this inverted pyramid 
um, is, is to suggest something about my personal view of uh, level, level of investment sourcing and, and scaling kinds of issues here. So here I wanted to refer back to the, uh, I think another framework that people found uh, useful over the last couple of days uh, that Jim had, had, um, had developed in his remarks, the Hegel Singer uh, attention to, to business functions, uh, business functions in any firm, in our case in the library, firm, um, and uh, I'm just aligning that those same services and needs and, and acknowledging that on the top slice, we're really, I think, talking about services related with customer relationship management, uh, innovation opportunities around some parts of the metadata management, um, and then uh, infrastructure uh, services and support, or intrastructure, uh, as I call it here, because I, I really believe that our investment in the infrastructure is going to be as much about infrastructure for our community as it is about locally developed, um, highly customized uh, infrastructure. So probably more attention around customer relationship management. Clearly, we see opportunity in innovation, but our capacity to allocate resources in support of local institution scale innovation, uh, quite constrained. And uh, infrastructure, clearly important to us, much more likely to be sourced uh, collaboratively, I think. So uh, nearing, nearing, nearing conversation time, um, I did want to, to uh, think a little bit more about the locus of action. So as you may recall in my opening remarks on Tuesday, um, I was very interested in this, this, uh, this uh, question of what the, what the locus of service provision, what the locus of stewardship uh, is is likely to be. So it seems to me uh, we can think about whether or not the opportunities around these service uh, offerings, and again, this is my pick of interesting service offerings. Um, uh, you will have no doubt uh, different opinions. Um, uh, so this is really just uh, uh, reiterating what, what I'd said before. Uh, business intelligence around specifically this question of researcher uptake in as much as that helps uh, shape our, our selection decisions. Uh, the, the shared interest I think we have in articulating um, interoperability requirements for those selected workflow tools. And here I'm, I'm thinking not only of metadata interoperability across different platforms so that uh, as several people observe, you want to pick best of breed and plug them into your own local uh, environment and therefore we're going to be dependent on interoperability of these tools. But it seems to me it also relates to a concern around uh, data governance. So we heard a lot of people saying, I'm really uncertain about externalizing some of this research information management support uh, to the scholarly publication industry because after all, aren't they just gonna come back and sell it to me again? Uh, quite probably. Uh, <laughs> but that said, our approach to that can't be just to walk away. <clears throat> it has to be a, a strong negotiating position for understanding what our expectations are about appropriate use of uh, data that is uh, sourced, uh, sourced from us. Uh, machine readable selection profiles. Uh, uh, this is that's a specific reference to to Cliff's um, uh, recommendation that we think very seriously and, and urgently about the need for uh, expressing in a machine readable format our institutional and collective stewardship priorities. This was the analogy to, to, uh, to old approval plans or the, or the conspectus indeed. Uh, with respect to, to metadata services, it does seem to me that some of the operational shift will have to be um, a, a recognition of the increasing importance of, of identifiers and uh, relationships between different uh, information assets. So, so uh, yesterday a, a speaker observed that that uh, data in isolation is of low value. Right, the, the more isolated the information, the less value it creates. We're operating in an environment where the richness of your associations, the density of your links, is a really important indicator of your uh, importance in, in the network environment. So it seems to me that in thinking about our shifting our metadata focus, more attention to identifiers, more attention to the relationships between your ORCID, your DOI, um, a variety of other 
uh, institutional uh, identifiers will, will be important. And finally, uh, I found very interesting, although I think it was, um, it was closed down quite, quite rapidly, the notion that we should be thinking um, in, in, uh, in accounting terms almost about how to, how to place a value, or how to calculate, quantify the value for money in, in a renovated library service portfolio that is delivering a different kind of value uh, both to our faculty and students and, and to the parent institutions. It, it, it seems to me there is potentially some interesting opportunity there to, to rethink uh, support, um, including you know, indirect cost recovery in external grants for the, for the library. Uh, so some of those relate to recording infrastructure, others relate to archiving infrastructure. Um, we heard in Ricky's uh, summary of the workshops, these lists of um, issues and, and libraries should do this and libraries should do this other thing. And while we're at it, why don't we also do this other thing? Um, I, I, I don't disagree, libraries should do all, all kinds of things. Um, I, one of them is uh, make some choices um, about which things we actually are going to do, are prepared to, to make uh, commitments around uh, so this is again a rehash, but different frames, if you will, on, on the same uh, concerns around where we will take action uh, locally or, or collectively. This question of aggregating information about researcher workflow uh, uh, preferences. The, uh, the survey that uh, I think Keith, Keith had, had raised it, that the University of Utrecht uh, has developed uh, for surveying local research populations about the choices they're making in workflow support tools. This, this is, here, I'm, here I'm getting to the how. Everything else was the what. This is like, if we were going to do something, how would we do it? Well, we could think about collectively organizing uh, a campaign to, to, um, to compile survey results from that investigation of workflow behaviors. Why create a new survey? One, a very good one, is already out there. So there's the question of do we do that work collectively? Do we think about this as something that we, within the context of the research library partnership, want to take on? Uh, collective business intelligence, or indeed is this something that, that is simply an institutional priority? Those of you who are interested to implement the survey at home uh, will, will do so. With respect to uh, uh, metadata management, um, uh, we heard a lot about the library role in engaging with this larger identifier environment, and, and ORCID in particular got a lot, of, a lot of attention. And it does seem to me that there's opportunity uh, for us to think about locally and or collectively, what do we want to do in this space? Do we have a point of view about what that engagement with faculty might look like? Do we want to develop best practices? Again, a question of where we, what the locus of action should be. Is it collective within, within our community? Is it something that you're just going to go home and, and uh, do on your own? And um, thinking, and I have to apologize to, to Karen for calling out one of her task groups here. Um, uh, I'm simply suggesting that there is a, a ready vehicle uh, for, for thinking about some of these issues. Some of them are already on the table for the metadata managers group, but, but leverage the capacity that we've got here, which includes some existing uh, working groups within the research library partnership. With respect to prioritization of uh, interoperability expectations for those selected workflow support tools, uh, here it seems to me that uh, that John McCall was really onto something in, in suggesting that this is a, this is a higher order problem. Um, that potentially needs attention, certainly within the context of the Research Library Partnership, but perhaps that's a meeting of minds of uh, international research library uh, consortia that all collectively have a stake in this. So maybe we, we need to elevate that uh, to an even higher order. And then finally, I think the, this interesting uh, opportunity around thinking about how we engage with faculty. How do we, how do we not fall into that trap of being viewed as, as an instrument of compliance rather than as, as uh, real partners, valued partners to our researchers and uh, faculty, seems to me also. Um, that's a really tractable problem, right? We, we collectively could, could put together uh, best practices, develop case studies around what has worked and what has not. Uh, so those were my thoughts. Um, I, I think it would be um, good to have uh, some general conversation around this. I just threw these up as, as a way of thinking about it. It seems to me we need to be thinking about what do we individually and collectively want to do? 
what kind of time frame are we thinking about? What, what is the urgency here? Uh, we heard over the course of the last few days, a couple of people say, this is really urgent. We've got to get right on this. Other things we all seem to think are important, but you know, maybe it's something that you know, doesn't have to happen for the next five or 10 years. It needs, I think we need to have some, some, uh, some shared understanding of what our expectations of time frame might be. And then this question of, of locus. Um, so so I, I, I'd like to open it up for some discussion now about what you all feel is the opportunity for action. But um, I did particularly want to give um, Jan Molendijk an opportunity to, to say a little bit more about this uh, University of Utrecht survey, simply because it's, it's, it's a vehicle that's, that's already available. Um, they're, they're in the course of, of uh, pushing it out internationally. So given that it's a ready vehicle, it's, it's the um, the work of a partner institution, potentially an interesting opportunity for all of us to think about engaging. Yeah. Kramer, who, who've, uh, of course, made this wonderful in inventory of, of uh, uh, research tools and uh, potential workflows. Uh, what we, the next step that we envision is to, to put some uh, quantitative data behind that, uh, because now it's all based on inventory and uh, some anecdotal evidence talking to local researchers and some internationals. Um, so uh, they, they've put together this, uh, this survey uh, and they've done it, I think, in a, in a smart way to allow um, institutions to take part, uh, uh, push the survey out to their researchers and then um, while contributing to the, to, to the uh, total survey also get uh, information back yeah based on their own uh, institution's responses. Um, I, I particularly liked uh, Constance's suggestion that it, this could also be something that, that the uh, uh, Research Library Partnership uh, take on in, in promoting, and uh, so, so that might be a, a, an opportunity. Um, if you're interested in, uh, in uh, asking your researchers to, uh, to complete that survey, uh, please let Consens or, or me know. Um, my email is in the in the participants list, um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll make sure that that you get uh, uh, the right uh, URL to use, etc. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I'd be curious to hear. Oh, sorry, that's loud. Um, I'd be curious to hear how that survey. Um, compares with or doesn't the Ithaca uh, faculty research survey. Um, I saw that Roger Schoenfeld might have been registered here, but he's not here. I am on that advisory board for the development of that survey, and it's in revision right now. And um, it's perhaps another player in the same marketplace. Uh, you know, that's that's a, a very good, oh, sorry, Jan, are you perhaps? I, I, well, I was just going to say, I don't know. That's a yeah. very short uh, It seems to me they're, they, you're, you're right. They're, they're, um, they're related. The, um, the Utrecht survey is very specifically about, at this point in your research workflow, of these tools, which are you using? Um, and because the, the, the uh, Jerome and Bianca have created such a nice inventory, you know, almost 500 discrete workflow tools. Um, it's it's starting. You know, people don't have to scratch their head about what might I be using. That they've already compiled that list. They've already set it up in a survey. So that. But you're you're quite right to to point to the relationship with uh, with Ithaca's uh, interest in understanding uh, changing uh, um, uh, faculty behaviors and expectations. Of, of the library, and you're right, we should think about how to make that join up with, with Roger. Do others have uh, top of mind concerns about how we might collectively, in the context of the Research Library Partnership, uh, address some of these challenges? Do you have uh, do you have a conviction about where, from a research perspective, we should be putting um, more uh, more attention? Um, are there, you know, as I, I say, I, I, I identified 
four or five service opportunities that seemed uh, interesting to me that might be ripe for collaboration, but it's, um, it reflects nothing more than my, my personal opinion. So I would be quite interested to hear if, if any of you have um, clear and distinct, or even not clear and distinct, uh, ideas about where, where there's real opportunity for uh, library movement in this space. Oh, yes, thank you. This is such a restrictive list, I hate, I hate to, um, to, to, to dwell on it, although it was my intent to put up really concrete examples of here's something we could do. Um, but as I say, I mean, there are certainly uh, many, many other examples. My notebook was full of things that could have been on this list, but I made my choices. I can say that in terms of the second bullet, the current OCLC um, research partners work task group on representing organizations in ISNI um, is in the process of developing out what we're calling outreach documents about why organizational identifiers are important and what the benefits of them are. The first one that's out for review now is targeted to academic administrators. Um, but others on the task group said that we should also develop outreach specifically to funders and to publishers. So I think it doesn't address that whole broad thing, but it, it addresses at least part of it. And I was interested uh, in, the, in the break. Uh, I was, was speaking with, um, with some colleagues. I can't see if Sherry's still here. Um, very interested in, in the credit work that, that Amy Brand uh, described and uh, thinking very sensibly about the fact that uh, the library knowing that this is coming is, is, um, is a nice card to have in your deck for the library to return to uh, research administration offices and and highlight the fact that this activity is going on. So so this um, I think speaks to, to some of the concerns that um, that Keith and and others raised about um, making certain that the library is viewed as an expert partner in these affairs, not just that instrument of of, of compliance told to go gather up information that we we know. Um, and we, are, some, are contributing to these efforts to, to rethink uh, authorship models, and that will have an impact on our, our metadata, and we should be feeding that information uh, back into our other um, campus partners. Um, so I just want to maybe pick up on, um, I guess, the case studies of successful that, although I'm kind of struggling with it because I'm not quite sure what could be achieved um, very quickly and by, uh, you know, at this kind of level. But I do think for many of us, you know, like I said, one of my takeaways is trying to have those conversations and raising the um, awareness and thinking in that vein with the, um, so with the faculty in the arts and humanities that are kind of out of the obvious, easy metric kind of systems and, and so how to, how to um, effectively have those and raise, you know, the work that's going on there, which is a combination of, you know, in the past they've been publishing books, which mm -hmm, are part mm -hmm. of the, um, certainly part of what's in WorldCat, but then increasingly, I think, in the humanities, they're moving towards some of these far more creative kinds of um, Right. expressions yeah. of their work. And, and this is an area that I don't think is being well um, picked up by the commercial s um, vendors. So, so it's an area I think we should try to explore, but I don't have much more. To, I think it's a good idea. I don't know. Yeah, so, that, um, so I wonder if I can ask a, a, a question of um, UC CDL colleagues here. To, to what extent does uh, faculty engage with Decision making around the, um, the 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 resources that are used in that metadata harvesting. So we we heard you know there's a sort of the canonical places you go to for much of the uh, for the journal literature, but institutions have to make decisions about what those other sources of metadata might be, and that 
seems to me, I mean, presumably librarians will know more than, than faculty members about what the appropriate metadata aggregations might be for some of it, but, but to the extent that we maybe aren't tracking as attentively as, as we might be, uh, where those other spaces are, there's, there's an opportunity to, to help inform our, our uh, vendor partners, our metadata harvesting partners, um, about where those other metadata aggregations might be. So even, even if they're not in place yet, you could think if you wanted to shape a reputation and ranking uh, system, you know, at the at the institution or, or consortium scale, in a way that is provides a, a, a richer representation of, say, scholarship in in the arts and, and humanities. Uh, we we can shape that. We we can work with our faculty to identify the kinds, not just of of publication formats, but where those things live. So in the interest of automation, right? Because we don't want to get back into the world of people having to to type in uh, individual metadata, except where that's that's absolutely necessary. So I think that's a real opportunity. I'll just jump in here quickly. Um, I agree absolutely, and. Um, uh, I think that the faculty are involved, in, from my perspective, I mean, I, I'm sure, Martha, you're having different conversations, but from, from our perspective, we're hearing concern that Web of Science and Scopus will not be good sources of metadata for the folks in the humanities. And so we actually had a conversation with the vendor and identified a very significant um, index in the uh, arts and humanities, which will remain nameless right now. You can probably guess what it is. Um, and they're about to announce a relationship with that index. And so that's going to fill an enormous gap for us. Um, and it's not about the sort of, you know, the small idiosyncratic uh, yeah, indexes, yeah. But, but, but the index of that, of that domain. Um, and so the work that we can do, I think, to, to help the vendors understand the importance of those additional indexes and the, you know, the way that that can amplify our effect beyond anything we could do individually with faculty is, is pretty significant. That, that's fascinating to have that, that concrete example of how you've already, you know, sort of turned the bend there in, in identifying, you know, a, a core uh, index that might already have been included but, but wasn't. That's, um, it's, uh, it's cause for, for celebration, I guess, as evidence of the fact that, that we, you know, in this case, CDL has made that change happen and presumably any other um, uh, institution that would be implementing elements will, will benefit from that. Collectively, we can do even more of that, I would wager. Looking at point number three, I think that we're all trying to do so many different things with the data that we're collecting for our institutions and we've got different requirements in different countries and as Walter was mm -hmm. saying we've got we're at different parts of the the business cycle and I think that could be quite a difficult thing for us to all work on together but I think if we worked on the metadata that is going to link the different parts of the research mm -hmm. cycle whatever I think the ORCIDs, the ISNIs, the DOIs, the, the unique identifiers of everything in the research um, area would be where we could concentrate our efforts quite successfully together with um, no worry that we weren't all on the same page. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, thank you. That's, it's, it's, a, um, it's a good reminder too of, again, something that I think Jim had alluded to, of, of acknowledging that the, the important uh, differences from from one national context to another might uh, might constrain you know the level at which we can actually uh, cooperate. So that's yeah, very well noted. Yeah. I'm just wondering, and the observation is, all of the things that uh, are listed there are things that various groups in the research library partners group can do. So how are those then aggregated up into like a dashboard of something? We're all very um, pressed for time to try and follow all these pieces and yet Twitter helps and blogs help and things like that. But what type of activity could OCLC research partners do to help aggregate hmm. some of the work that's being done in these types of areas? Because we're all at different places so, and we're all not going to be 
interested in one of these things at the same time. Uh, that is an excellent point, Gail, and um, I have to say I don't have an answer for that. Um, I, I, I take it on board as a, as a recommendation, though. Um, you know, just out of my own experience, I, I think discovering that other people are farther down the path of the, you know, sort of inventorying of, of, uh, of registration vehicles, recording infrastructure, call it, call it what you like. Um, I sure don't want to do that again. I, I want somebody to point me to the place that's already done that work. Um, and similarly, down this line and, and other, uh, other related areas, I think very important to, to keep track of who's contributing where and how far along um, we are, and I don't, maybe Ricky has a suggestion for how we're going to do that. <laughs> I, had an, <clears throat> I had another question, which was about the, <clears throat> about the recording and archiving layers. And when you look at most of the depository or disciplinary repositories and government repositories, sometimes they're just about metadata, but almost very seldom do they claim to be the preservation home for the things that the objects that they do have and they have no interest in doing that and they'll say well we assume that the author's university is the you know the place where the work will be preserved so i'm wondering about how to establish relationships with them that will I mean, because a lot of times the faculty stuff goes directly there and doesn't stop at the university how do you establish a relationship with them to get the stuff into an archive without challenging their role. I mean, they've already got the, the attention of the people in that discipline. They shouldn't feel challenged. They should feel glad that it's being preserved. So I don't know how, how to go about establishing relations or criteria or a way to communicate about that. Kristen Antle from Caltech. I didn't hear the original um, presentation that Herbert von Sample made about the recording and archiving layers and kind of explaining the, the differentiation there. But it seems to me that a lot of the things that were listed as examples in the recording layer are really also um, are serving archival purposes or in essence have to be. They're, they're so de facto um, central and important. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know if Pub PubMed Central, for instance, uh, puts itself right. out there as, as, as a preservation uh, repository. But I think we have to kind of assume that it will be, and we have to kind of count on it for that. And, you know, similarly, I don't know, uh, Hati Trust or, or, you know, Internet Archive, I don't know exactly where they fall, or even, let's say, Google Scholar or Google. I mean, I think to a certain extent, we have to rely on those as, even though they may not self-declare as preservation repositories. That they're so central to the way scholarship is conducted and, 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 and scholars think about the world, that in, in a certain sense, it seems like they have to be. That, that boundary, I mean, we're, in, in a way, I'm afraid we're, we're, we're viewing that boundary through our own lens mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. of, you know, our very high standards of, you know, libraries becoming involved and, and, and the, whatever the preservation standards and are they met and so on, that it's a little artificial. That's yeah, no, no. I actually, I, I, um, I, I take that to heart, and, and I do worry about our our being um, overly ambitious about how much of this stewardship we want that we expect to be held to the standards of of library stewardship because the, the problem is just so uh, so enormous. And uh, you know, it seems to me that that the situation you're you're describing of a uh, uh, an expectation, a silent expectation of, of preservation uh, is, is analogous to, to what we've had um, in, in the print environment, right, where we've said, surely ARL libraries will never divest of their print collections. Uh, we're safe just as long as ARL is around, we'll have all the books, right? Uh, well, you know, that's now getting a little bit closer to a negotiated settlement about who's going to keep what. Um, or at least an acknowledgement that, that the pressures are such that that, um, that more of the dependencies are, are being revealed. And it does seem to me that even, uh, even if one couldn't get as far as uh, proclamations from some of the, the de facto uh, repositories about their preservation uh, intents, highlighting the degree to which scholarly communications relies on that, 
it helps us to, to say, you know, we, 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 we would take on some more of that if, as Ricky says, for a specific disciplinary repository that's metadata only, we don't have a preser we do not as a community have a, a preservation plan for that content. But let's, let's carve it up and find out where those problems are because individually and collectively, I say we can only own so much of that we're going to have to we're going to have to depend on others with with potentially different expectations of what stewardship amounts to though hopefully it will include some of the content and not just the metadata i love metadata but it only gets you so far uh, i i i could do this all day um, um, but I bet you want to go home and feed your cat. Um, I'm, I'm seriously. I'm just noticing that it's it's uh, two o'clock, and I'm sure some of you have have expectations of of being elsewhere. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if we had a fixed uh, end time for for the session, but I certainly don't want to um, delay those of you who need to to be um, in other places. Uh, Jim, did you want to? Did you have a final comment there? That makes it sound too daunting, actually. Uh, what I was going to, uh, I was going to try and join up the the comments about uh, surveying researcher tool set and workflow preferences, with um, a, you know kind of variation on that that third bullet about metadata interoperability. Um, it, you know, it seems to me if if if, if we had you know evidence about preferences and about the you know, the relative take up of, um, you know, toolkits uh, or, or, you know, recording infrastructure, because I think these things are, 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 are related. Um, it, it, could, it, it could focus you on some places where some additional work would, would benefit a lot of people. So yeah. um, you, you could imagine understanding the, the relative presence of some some tools in personal infrastructures, um, and that they would benefit from some kind of, of, of middleware that allows them to move things easily into preferred recording infrastructures. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that uh, uh, you know, coordinating yeah. you know would benefit everybody. Uh, if you if you know something about those recording infrastructures, then then. Uh, those preferred recording infrastructures, then it seems to me being able to have uh, uh, a conversation with them about you know yep. a broad set of community needs. I mean, imagine what's what's the nature of the con. If you could have a conversation with the slide share people, what would it be? Mm -hmm. what, what what would you like them to do? Uh, and what would we have to be prepared to do in order, you know, to to take advantage of some. Um, Willingness on their part to uh, uh, to, to work together. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm just thinking about you know joining those things up. I and and, and, and in a way that goes beyond a, an individual institutional investigation. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Th thank you for for making that um, connection. It's it's delightful to work with somebody who can read your mind. Um, it it uh, it saves us so much on communications. Um, uh, yes, no, that was. I mean, I, it does seem to me there is there is a, a connection between those two, and um, my hope would be that better business intelligence about uh, where our our uh, faculty and researchers are voting with their feet with respect to, to to utilization of tools would help us to make the selection decisions about which ones we form uh, partnerships with and and then because we collectively as you say we we have we have community leverage to say listen you know you're you're a, you're a potentially a really useful partner to make I mean, it's, it for them it's market share for us it's it's successful externalization with a partner that has um, I think to the point that was raised before that maximizes the dependency on that infrastructure and makes it really hard for them to walk away from some of our expectations unless they want to lose the entire market Silence falls. Um, I think that uh, I think we'll 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 leave it there. I um, will certainly be thinking more about how to to move forward from um, from from the discussions of the last um, 
several days uh, with respect specifically to work around the evolving scholarly record. Um, but it seems to me in, in these two related but different veins of, you know, what are the, what are the uh, implications uh, and, and, you know, what's the related action agenda for, uh, for research libraries, but also uh, the degree to which it, it, it joins up with these uh, related interests around uh, uh, reputation and, and ranking. So uh, we're, we're enormously grateful to those of you who were prepared to, to um, do the long, the long haul with us. Uh, it was uh, a real pleasure to have you all here with us for the last uh, several, several days. And uh, we'll look forward to more communications with all of you. Um, if you have uh, final needs um, in terms of logistics, uh, any one of us who's here is happy to help. And I think Jeanette is still out there. Um, thank you all for, for a really successful and enjoyable couple of days together. <laughs>